Good morning. Uh, I'm Linda Henderson. I am an accounting professor here at Coastal. Been here for quite a while, I might say. Um, I actually am a CPA, a certified public accountant. Uh, my first job as a CPA was with a large accounting firm in Bogota, Colombia, doing international and U.S. taxation for U.S. expatriates. Those are people who work for big corporations for the U.S. Co corporation, but they get assigned overseas. And so we used to jump in every year and do all of their taxes. Uh, one of my more interesting experiences in that capacity was when um, actually the chief executive officer of a large uh, oil and natural gas company was kidnapped. Um, and so they, of course, called his accountants. And we had to file the tax return uh, for this ki kidnapped U.S. taxpayer. Uh, he actually survived the experience, but while he was gone, we were confronted with the fact that even if you're kidnapped, you still have to file a tax return. <laughs> so we were going to write a letter to, an outraged letter to the Internal Revenue Service saying, what do you mean? You know, this poor guy is chained to a bed someplace, who knows where. We don't know if he's going to survive, and we've got to file a timely tax return, and the answer is, yeah, pretty much. You've got to do that. So anyway, uh, accounting may look as though it's kind of a, I won't, I won't say boring, but sometimes people think, oh, you're sitting in an office and you're dealing with numbers day in and day out. You have no contact with, with the world outside. Not true. There are uh, accountants everywhere, and what I want to try to show you today is a little bit about what you can expect if you are interested in the accounting major. And so this is a presentation um, about the accounting major, and what I want to do is kind of bring it to Coastal so that you understand by the time I've finished talking to you uh, what we do here at Coastal, what our accounting graduates do, what accountants do in general. So that's basically the idea behind this. So these are the topics that I'd like to get through, maybe not exactly in this order. Uh, what do accountants do? And I'm going to try to tie that a little bit into the article that you were assigned. Uh, professional certifications, majoring in accounting at CCU, what are our graduates doing after they graduate, and uh, a little bit about selecting your major. So the first thing is, uh, and this is kind of a scenario, what do accountants do? And I was trying to think of a, of a typical situation that you might be familiar with. And since we're all Americans and we all have debt, I thought a really good place to start would be to talk about a loan application. So this is a case in which we've got a common business decision. We have a banker. We have a loan officer at a bank. And he's considering a loan application from a mid-sized bank, let's say someplace in South Carolina. And the bank is having to decide whether to make this loan or not, looking at whether the company can pay back the amount that was borrowed and in interest, which is the income to the bank. And the company needs to be able to establish that it can pay it back on time and in full. And so the bank has to look at certain things that are submitted by this company, and they are. Um, first of all, the bank's going to ask for financial statements for several years. They want to know whether the company's making money. They want to know how much debt the company already has. So are they likely to be positioned to be able to make enough money to pay back the loan and to pay the interest? They're also going to look at tax returns. And oftentimes this is where the rubber meets the road because a company files a tax return and can get into an awful lot of trouble if the numbers are not accurate and do not fairly present the company's situation. If it's a small enough company, the bank's also going to ask for the personal financial statements and tax return of the owners because if it's a small enough company, who stands behind the company? It's the owner. So that's the person or persons at risk. So then the, um, the question is, who prepares all this information? So here's the company going to the bank with all this information. Where did they get the information? First off, the loan documents were prepared by the finance department of the company. And I w wanted to mention that we call, in most corporations, you have a finance department or a finance division. But really, what that is today is it's finance. Where does the capital come from? Where does it go? And it's also accounting. And so the line, it used to be you had two separate departments. You'd have a finance department and you'd have an accounting department. But the realization is that these are really two related topics and they need to be together. So we find that we also have financial statements. These tend to be prepared by the company accountants. We have these financial statements have been audited by external auditors, more accountants. And what is an audit? An audit is where 
Somebody comes in, looks at the financial statements, tests the accounts, looks at the process, looks at all the controls that are in that company to try to make sure that the numbers make sense. And then at the end of the day, they say, yeah, they look pretty good. And then everybody says, oh, those are audited statements. They must have some reliability. The tax returns are prepared by tax specialists who rely on information prepared by the company. So all of these are accounting jobs, basically. So what do accountants do? They prepare financial accounts. They do the financial statements. They actually provide information about how a company is doing. Auditors test the information to determine if it fairly presents the company's operations. And so that's our auditor again. And they're independent, sort of, of the company. They get paid by the company, but we consider them independent uh, so that the public can actually trust that process. We have tax accountants who prepare tax returns, carry out tax planning, and this is vital to just about every entity, uh, not-for-profit included. <coughs> we have internal auditors. We have internal audit function here at Coastal, and the function of the internal auditor is to see if the assets are being used wisely. Um, money, of course, but it could also be, well, how about building usage? How about the utility bill? All kinds of different things that they might look at. We have management accountants who prepare budgets and plan for operations. Financial statements, I want to just mention briefly about some of these financial statements. Uh, financial statements are prepared at least annually, and they include the audit report of the independent auditor that we mentioned. They present information of interest to decision makers, and some of these questions are, how did the company do this year? Did they make money? Did they lose money? Uh, what does the company own? What are the assets of the company? What are the resources that the company has that the company can use to make profits in the future? How much does it owe? Are there liabilities on the company books? And you, you're going to find that just about every company does have liabilities. And then finally, how much cash does it have? I think uh, if you like to read financial press type releases, you probably read that US corporations are sitting on something like $2 trillion worth of cash right now. Two trillion, that's trillion with a T. That's an awful lot of money, and what it means is that one, these big companies are not having a cash flow problem, and two, they probably don't know where to put the money. I think we're starting to see that they're looking more into investing some of that cash right now by acquiring other companies, mergers and acquisitions, and that sort of thing. But you look at the financial statements to see how much cash does a company have, and where does the cash come from, where does it go? You can look up these financial statements of any company. Say you're interested in a particular company, you've heard about something, someone's talking about a new company that you haven't really gotten any information about. What can you do? You can go to www.sec.gov. Gov, of course, is government. What's SEC? What does SEC stand for? Security. Securities and Exchange Commission, absolutely. And so if you're interested in a company, you can go, and this is public information, folks. In the United States, this is put out there. Every publicly traded company that's traded on an exchange or over the counter in the US has got to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. What does that mean? It means there's probably more information about these companies than you're ever going to be able to digest. But if you're curious about a company, go to sec.gov. They have the Edgar system that allows you to get into these financial statements. And there's, some of those companies have long lists of filings with the SEC. Um, anything that they, if insiders selling the stock, they've got to file with the SEC, financial statements and so forth. You can find out all this information. So here's an example. This is the ExxonMobil example. And some questions that you might ask about ExxonMobil. Y'all know ExxonMobil, right? Mm -hmm. Buy their gas, yeah. So here's some typical questions. How did the company do last year? Profit, loss, how did it do? How many shares of stock does this company that have that are outstanding? In other words, how widely owned is it? Um, how large is the company? It's one of the biggest. You can compare it with other companies. Uh, and how much cash does it have? So let's see what some answers are. First, how did the company do last year? 2012 is not out yet. 2012 will not be available probably until the end of March. But for 2011, it was 41, what? Billion. Billion dollars. 41 billion dollars. That's net income. That's all the income, all the revenues that the company made, minus all the expenses that they incurred and paid. That's their bottom line. So that looks pretty good, doesn't it? 
Seems as though they could cut the price of gas a little bit, maybe? Yeah. You think? You think they're going to do that? Nope. nope. They're just going to raise it and raise it. Yeah, I think some other people are getting some money out of that, too. Uh, my second question was, how many shares of stock are outstanding? In other words, how widely held is this company? How many people own? This doesn't give you the, the head count, but it gives you an idea of how many shares of stock, that's little pieces of ownership in ExxonMobil, are out in the public and being traded every day. The number of shares was 8 billion shares. So just about, does that mean everybody in the United Sta States owns ExxonMobil stock? No. Anybody in here own any ExxonMobil stock? <laughs> you wish? <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of your grandmothers probably own ExxonMobil. Question three, how large is the company? Well, a good way to figure this out is to look at the balance sheet and say, well, how much does it own altogether? What are the resources of this company altogether that they can use to generate profits in the future? And the answer is $331 billion. That was in 2011. I'm sure it's gone up since then. And my last question is, how much cash does it have? How much cash does it have? Well, look at the statement of cash flows. This is one of the financial statements. You can look at the statement of cash flows. And at the end of 2011, it was almost $13 billion. $13 billion. That's a pretty healthy size. Um, I asked you to read uh, an article, and I, I had to apologize because I, I forgot that the article was supposed to be relatively short. And what I found instead is an article that is rather kind of like a small book. It's in Time Magazine, and I had a copy of it here. I started reading it. I think it took me two days to read it. But what I liked about this article, and it's called The Bitter Pill, and it's in uh, the most recent Time Magazine that just came out. This is an article that's not so much about accounting as it is about using accounting. And what this article is all about is where the costs and the prices come from in the US uh, health care industry. Um, it's very interesting, and it gives you a really good idea of what you can do uh, in terms of using accounting numbers to analyze and understand what's going on in a given industry. So what we're doing in the B Bitter Pill, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. You're perfectly uh, able to read the first, what, 10 pages or something to get an idea about it. Uh, it's comparing costs for basic services. So we need a basis of comparison. One of the things that I think was interesting was that they said, oh, OK, here's a Tylenol, a pill. A pill of Tylenol costs a dollar if you are given the Tylenol in a hospital. But you can buy 100 of them for $1.49. So there's a little, this is what we call a markup. So we're, we're having a gross margin here that is, is many, many percentage points over the basic cost of the, of the pill. Here's another one. Simple chest x-ray was billed. And th this guy went through actual hospital bills. And is pulling the numbers off those bills. Um, simple chest x-ray was billed for $283. But Medicare, which is in a position to bargain with hospitals and say, we're not going to pay what you ask necessarily. We're going to pay what we think this is worth. Medicare pays $20.44, a huge difference. That's like almost, it's over, uh, how many percentage markup is that? We should all be so lucky. Here's another one. There's a cancer wonder drug that they try. I think it's called Rituxin or something like that. The one injection was billed to an individual who's cited in this article, and he was billed $13,700 for the one injection, right? They figured that the hospital paid $4,000. That's a lot. $4,000 for one injection, that's a lot of money. But isn't that kind of a healthy markup? And so what the idea is in this article is, my gracious, you know, where are they getting these numbers? So the bitter pill is using financial disclosures, some tax returns, financial statements, and so forth. A lot of these hospitals are not for profit, as you're going to see when you read the article. <coughs> Pointing out that hospital CEOs are making more than university presidents. So again, what are they doing? They're taking accounting information and using it as a basis for analyzing reasonability. Is this a, a reasonable price or not? You look at, uh, uh, say, the president of Yale, who makes a whole lot less than the CEO of the hospital that is part of the Yale University system. Uh, some of the numbers are, are quite astonishing. Uh, we pay more for US health care than anybody else does in any other country. 
That's another, so again, it's a basis of comparison. Look at this, the price structure in the US, compare it with something else, and it helps you make up your mind. Healthcare industry spends far more on lobbying. This is another thing that I had never seen. It was something like, since 1998 to 2009, the healthcare industry spent over $5 billion on lobbying whereas the defense and aerospace industries were down 1.8 billion, uh, oil and natural gas 1.3 billion, so it's a huge difference. So the conclusion here is not so much the policy implications of this article, uh, that's not why I'm recommending this. I'm not on either side of any of these issues. But I do want you to take a look at this article because it gives you an idea of what the accounting data can do as far as giving you information to work with and giving you a basis for making uh, your own decisions. So getting back to uh, preparing our graduates, we have a whole bunch of graduates in accounting and I wanted to kind of brag on them for a second. Uh, we've got kid, uh, kids who are getting graduate degrees, masters of accountancy, we've got master of tax, we have a certificate in fraud examination. We have a PhD in accounting elsewhere in the state that you can get. We don't actually have a Master of Tax or a PhD right now. Uh, where do our people go? They go into public accounting, doing audit work. Uh, they go into governmental and not-for-profit. Uh, they have corporate businesses. And I want to introduce you to some of our alums, some graduates in accounting. So you can't really see that too well, but the first one I wanted to mention is Lisa Lassiter, class of 2001. Um, she's a CPA a certificate. She has a CIA. This should be, I'm not sure if I can use this. Can I? Ah, I can. CIA. Uh, she's a certified internal auditor and she is a certified quality analyst. Um, she is now the director of finance at Myrtle Beach International Airport. And so she's handling all of this. She's like the controller and she's also doing the finance side <coughs> at, the, at the airport. Here's another of our graduates. This is Wyatt Henderson from 1998, he's a 98 graduate. He's a CPA, certified fraud examiner. Uh, he specializes in divorce financial arrangements and some other things. He has his own firm in Greer, South Carolina, in the upstate, Henderson Accounting. And he also happens to be chairman of the board of trustees of Coastal Carolina University. So he's a person who's willing to step out of the accounting role and actually uh, do something for his alma mater. Here's another one, Olin Utterback, also a graduate from 1998, and he is a CPA and he holds an MBA from the University of South Carolina. He's a uh, senior tax manager with one of the four big international accounting firms, that's Ernst & Young, and I put the address up there, right there. Look at that address, isn't that cool? So when he goes to work every day, where does he go? Just Times Square, five Times Square in New York City. Um, and he's helping um, us place some of our students with his firm. Also, in, I'm just going to throw up some, some places where some of our accounting grads work. Uh, we have a manager of commodity strategies in Montreal, Canada. He does all of his work in French. Bank manager in Bogota, Colombia. Does everything in Spanish. We have a, a senior consultant in Amsterdam, and he's actually a South African. We have both a controller and an assistant controller working with Marriott International, the hotels in the Virgin Islands, and that's a real hardship post, as you can imagine. We have a financial controller with a, a big printing press in Stockholm, and I think he's learning Swedish. He doesn't, he's not a native speaker. We have a, a, a very successful grad who's working for what we call the PCAOB, right? Whoops, let me see if I can get my little, here we go. PCAOB, which is a public company accounting oversight board, which is impossible to say. So what do we call it? Peekaboo. Peekaboo. So that's Peekaboo. Uh, and this is one of our graduates from, um, from 1997. Um, and she is now an official with this government agency that is tasked with overseeing all public accounting uh, for these big companies. And we also have a park manager for South Carolina Department of Parks, Recreation, and tourism in Sherall, South Carolina. And he has something like 50 people answering to him. So these are all accounting positions, but you can see they're not traditional tax audit type positions, all of them. They're, they're branching out into a lot of other things. What qualities do they share? They like numbers. Uh, they can find answers for you, and they take pride in that. Very professional people. 
uh, hardworking, disciplined. Uh, they're dedicated to the profession. And they're able to transfer their strengths into the other areas. Many of them start in traditional counting situations and move on to other types of jobs. So the preparation of accountants, and this is going to get, tie us back to what we require of accountants here at Coastal. The first is the accounting profession. We've kind of talked about that. Education, certifications. In accounting, one of the major issues is getting certified so that you're actually communicating to, the, to potential employers that you have a certain skill set. Uh, continuing professional education is part of it. Um, are you interested in professional certifications? Most of our accounting majors are. Um, I think st you're studying for the CPA exam right now, aren't you, Whitney? Yes, ma'am. So when are you scheduled to take the first part? The first part of April. The first part of April, okay. So we're, that's a, a huge exam, and I think I'm going to get at it in just a second. <coughs> so certified public accountant, uh, certified management accountant. These are some of the certification plans. Uh, I'm going to show you some salaries in a minute. Chartered Global, Global Management Accountant, the CGMA, which is brand new. Uh, certified Internal Auditor. Remember, Lisa Lassiter is a certified Internal Auditor. And we've got um, Enrolled Agent, which means you are enrolled to practice before the Internal Revenue Service. So that's all tax, all the time. Other certifications, um, one of the big ones that we see and that we actually prepare our students for is Certified Fraud Examiner. Uh, some of these others are not as well known. But this is kind of some information <clears throat> from 2011, I believe, on salaries. So we start off here with, um, say, let's just look at this age group right here, 19 to 29. And these would be average salaries for people coming out of school. Here's the average salary for an accountant coming out of school starting salary 52,000. Now that's an average across the United States. So if you're in New York, it's probably higher. If you're in Raleigh, it's probably lower. If you're in Myrtle Beach, you know, it, it, it adapts more or less to where you are. If you have, let me go back to this. If you have, a, if you're a certified management accountant, you're starting out just a little bit below 60, 60,000. If you're a CPA, you start off just a little bit above 60,000. <coughs> and if you have both, it's more like 73,000. And notice that the CMA starts off a little bit lower, but then gets higher and higher. And that is, I believe, because CMA certified management accountants are working in corporate America. And you remember all that cash they have? That's where the wealth is. And so they tend to have higher salaries. CPAs, on average, can work for big firms, but they can also have their own firm. So if you're a CPA and you want to stay in Myrtle Beach, you can hang out your shingle here, establish your own office, have a tax practice, tax audit. You could do bookkeeping, all kinds of stuff. And maybe your income would not be as high. But uh, as you can see, it, it is a significant amount. Uh, once you get up into the 40 uh, to 49 range, uh, we're seeing a difference between CMA and CPA, but I would say these are pretty good salaries, basically. And, it, and again, they're averages. So people who make more and some who make less. Certified public accountant, this is what um, Whitney is studying for. It's a well-known certification. These are the requirements, academic requirements. You've got to have a college degree. This could change from state to state. There's a uniform exam. What is that exam? How many parts is it? Four. So there are four parts. It's a computer-based exam. You can take one part at a time, right? What, what is the strategy? You study like heck while you're an undergraduate. You maybe get a Master of Accountancy. And then when you get ready to take the exam, guess what? You study for it. And you study hard. Uh, our students will buy a review course or somehow get a review course. And you spend 100 to 150 hours studying for each part of the exam. And then you go out and sit for it. And you can pass one part at a time, which makes it pretty accessible, really. There's also a professional ethics exam right here. <coughs> and then there's an experience requirement. You have to have a year's experience working for a CPA in South Carolina. It would be you, you're working for a CPA who is certified in South Carolina. Uh, so this is the well-known, the most well-known. It also requires 150 hours of college credit. So if you're interested in accounting, uh, most of our students who are in accounting are interested in the CPA exam. 
they're aware of the fact they've got to get 30 more hours after they graduate. So you graduate with 120, right? And then you have to add on another 30. Uh, it can be undergraduate, uh, like a double major. It could be a graduate credit. Uh, you must have an undergraduate degree to sit for the exam, but you need 150 hours to be licensed. Here's the CMA. This is the one and we just saw that the pay is a little bit higher. Uh, you must work for a large, uh, most of these folks work for large corporations. Many are international, uh, doing budgeting, financial management, lots of finance in this, special reports. Uh, undergraduate degree, you, there's another exam, but it's only two parts. Uh, part of it is all accounting, part of it's mostly finance. Two years of experience and you need to be a member of the organization. Uh, and here's some more, I don't want to spend any time on these. Leave a little bit of time for some questions. So, majoring in accounting at CCU. Start off with CBAD 201. And it's basically financial accounting. Remember those financial statements that I talked about a little earlier? This is where you figure out how they're put together and what kind of information they contain. Uh, 202 is managerial accounting. This kind of ties into the CMA, the Certified Management Accountant. It's budgeting and financial management of companies. And once you select your major, if you're uh, a finance or an accounting major, you have to take a course that we call Accounting Information Systems and Data Processing. That's part of the business core. If you're not an accounting finance major, you would be taking, what is it, 393. Uh, which is a management information systems uh, class. The way it's taught here is you get a lot of Excel and students come back later and say, boy, Dr. Cripple really taught a lot of Excel in that class. So if you're interested in uh, one of the major tools that we use in business, that's a good place to, to really be, become um, proficient. Uh, majoring in accounting, 24 hours. So you, it's a 24 hour major. Most of the other majors are 15, 18, 21 hours, so there's a little bit more accounting in this. Uh, you have to take intermediate accounting, cost accounting, commercial law, because there's a lot of legal stuff, contracts and so forth in accounting, auditing and uh, two courses in taxation. And I sort of think everybody should take at least one tax course, don't you think? Graduate programs, we have a Master of Accountancy, the MAC, and Whitney's in the MAC right now, going to graduate in August, right? Um, this is going to help our students reach the 150 hours, and it's exactly 30 hours. You can do the Master of Accountancy, fall, spring, summer, you're done. It's one year. Uh, we also have two new tracks that are coming on board. We've got the Fraud Examination Certificate. We we're talking in terms of introducing the Taxation Track and the Assurance Track, which is basically auditing. And we have some student organizations, and we actually have the boss right here. So Whitney Hux, would you please tell us a little bit about this? Sure. Well, I was asked to come speak on Madoff Sci and the Accounting Club. This is just different ways you can get involved with accounting. So first, a little bit about Madoff Sci. Madoff Sci is the Accounting Honor Society on campus. However, it is part of a national organization, so it's pretty well known. So if you're, you know, if you're not from here and you're going back home to whatever state you're from, you know, you still have Madoff Sci on the resume. It still looks really good. And we have a variety of different things to help prepare our members for the profession and to be well-rounded when they come out. So we're just going to give you an example of what some of these things are. We have professional meetings where we have different people from the profession, whether it be in the community or from different firms, they come and speak to us. And that gives us a lot of valuable insight into the profession, what they do with their career path, what their position is. Um, we also have informative meetings about grad school, about international business, just a lot of different things. Um, it's good networking, good connections, um, great opportunities. Examples of that are our Meet the Firms Night and our Spring Banquet. We tend to have more professionals there than students, and so it's a good way to go and talk and get to know a lot about CPAs and local and regional firms. Uh, we also have a lot of service projects that we're a part of. Last semester, we raised money for the Wounded Warrior Project through a bowl of fun. We also had a Toys for Tots drive. We help tutor in the accounting lab, and then this semester we're going to be raising money for March of Dimes. And each month we also help with uh, food distribution at a local church. And so, you know, they just help distribute groceries to those in need in the community. So it's a great way to just network and connect and get out there in the community and in the profession and meet many people. It helps you um, become a lot more well-rounded 
but it's also for upper level accounting majors, paid off size. So if you want to get involved or if you don't want accounting to be your major, but from all of this amazing stuff that you've heard today, you do want to get a little bit of you know, accounting in your background, you can join the accounting club. And that's for anyone to join. And they coordinate a lot with us in Beta Alpha Psi. So we still have good meetings, um, a lot of professionals, a lot of great networking opportunities. Wouldn't you agree? I would absolutely agree. So there we go. That's that. Thank you very much. You. Applause, yes. I um, wanted to just sort of mention a few things about choosing your major. First of all, how many of you already know what you're going to major in? OK, that's a pretty good number. You're not too sure? Um, a lot of people come into Coastal knowing what they want to major in, and then they change their minds. Uh, there are a lot of people who start taking accounting and, and realize that you know, accounting is tough. And then they look around, and they understand it all compared to other people in the class. And they're going, could it be that I'm supposed to be an accountant? And sometimes that happens in CBAD 201, the financial accounting class. Sometimes it happens in managerial accounting. And, and your professor comes up to you after class and says, have you ever thought about ma majoring in accounting? And you go, no, I don't want to be a major in accounting. But then you know, the more you think about it, maybe it's a good idea. But anyway, you're looking at your major and trying to factor in your interests, um, your talents and skill set, and your expectations for the future, and bring all of that to bear. And here's Whitney again. Isn't that so cute? I wanted to uh, actually give you a report based on a survey of senior accounting majors as to how they picked their major. Uh, Whitney was unusual in that she always knew she wanted to be a CPA. And that's because her dad was a CPA. And she used to get to go to the office, right? Yeah. And uh, play with old checkbooks is what it looks like. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty cool. So she knew from a very early age that, that was kind of where she was going to be. and she's been headed in that direction ever since. Not everybody knows right away what they want to be. Uh, and this is what I found out, asking senior accounting majors how they selected their major. 5% um, said, it's the only major that I can guarantee I'll be able to pay off my student loans. In other words, I know I'm going to get a job. I'm going to make enough money. I'll be able to pay off my student loans. That was only 5% who said that. 15% took accounting in high school and liked it. And so they basically carried that knowledge based on their high school experience. I don't know if anybody in here ever had accounting in high school. Anybody? Oh, a bunch of you. So if you liked it in high school, you might say, well, you know, this, this seems to be a good major. And we had 15% of our majors saying that. 25% took accounting for the first time at Coastal and decided they liked it and made the decision at that point. So they would have been sophomores, right, when they made that decision. 35% report, well, I'm good with numbers. I like to work with numbers. They make a lot of sense to me. I like math. Um, I've done volunteer tax work. I like taxes. They just had that affinity for, for problem solving with numbers. And 35% say, you know, it's the job opportunities. I'm pretty sure I can get a job. I think there's always going to be demand for accountants. Uh, an accounting major has an edge in the marketplace. Not everybody's an accounting major. It's a technical. Uh, degree, and it's going to give me uh, a leg up. That was more than 100%. Yeah. I, oh, golly. Did you hear that? Did I? Yeah. 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 He's got the number thing. Um, but there's some other factors that, that I want to just throw out there. And the first is, and this is Tom Kelly. He's a senior. He's going to be working for, uh, for one of our graduates, Olin Utterback, in New York when he graduates. He's from New York. He interned last summer with Ernst & Young. And we'll be going back there. And he said, I chose accounting because it's the language of business. In other words, if you can speak accounting, you're always going to land on your feet in the business world. He said his best advice was, I'd rather hire somebody with an accounting degree for a management position than hire a management person for an accounting position. And the point there, I think, is that if you're successful <coughs> at whatever you do, you can start off as an accountant or as a golf professional. If you're successful, you're probably going to end up handling the accounting and management part of the business. If you become the boss, it's all going to be on your back. So success brings with it the need to understand the accounting and to also understand management. Shanika Diggs is another senior accounting major. She's a Wall Fellow. She's from Chira. And she is planning to attend graduate school. She wants to be a CPA auditor for an NFL team. 
which I think is a really neat. I wonder if she still has that ambition <laughs> to ask her. I got this from her last semester. Uh, but she chose accounting because she loves it. So she, the idea is she wanted to find uh, a career in which she'd get up in the morning and be able to say, you know, I'm going to go to work whether they pay me or not, which is kind of an interesting thing. She says, I want to make money, of course, but I want my work to be more like a hobby than an obligation. And so what is this? This is, you don't want to get up every morning and go off to work and do something you don't like. And so I guess when you're thinking about picking your major, you're trying to figure, OK, I can get a job. I can make money. But I'm also going to love the work that I do. And I think that that's probably the lesson from these folks. And here are some of our recent graduates. There's Whitney right there. And, um, and I want to know if you have any questions for me. Yes, sir. Um, do you have to have an accounting major to get the CPA, or can it be any undergraduate degree? You could have any undergraduate degree, but you have to have taken certain classes. Okay. And so we have people who come in to the, to the master's level, and they have to take the prerequisites so that they can then take the upper level accounting classes. Okay. And um, so you, you'd probably have to look at what you take as an undergraduate to see how much more you'd have to add on. You have to take financial accounting. Like the state of South Carolina won't let you sit for the CPA exam unless you've got financial accounting, cost managerial, audit and tax. So you, they do prescribe certain classes. Yeah. Questions? Can you take the class test? Can you take like the class test and see like if you can get credits for accounting? You know, we've never had anybody take a CLEP test in accounting and pass. I'll be the first one. OK. <laughs> it's, it's possible. It hasn't happened yet. But it would be fun to see somebody do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to get that challenge. All right, all right. Questions? How many of you have had your taxes done? Did anybody go to the VITA? Or, you know, we have VITA on. Did you go? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is it, Tuesday, Thursday? Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday and Thursday. 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 Yeah, from 4.30 to 7 um, until tax filing season draws to an end. We have senior accounting majors doing free tax work for people in room 204. So you can sign up for that, get your taxes done for free. <coughs> Any more uh, comments, questions? Yes, sir. Actually, I have one talking about sitting for the CPA and how difficult it is and having to pass the four parts and all of that. Could you explain a little bit more to them about what's required even after you get your CPA with regards to having to stay current and you have to take credits and to keep your license? Absolutely. So what, what you do is, I guess we went through that pretty well, that uh, you take the CPA exam, you've got the 120 hours, you have to earn another 30 hours. <clears throat> but once you're a CPA, the, the learning doesn't stop. Um, you have continuing professional education that you have uh, every year. It tends to be about 40 hours a year of continuing professional education. If you work for a big firm, they're basically going to plug you in and pay for that. If you're an independent CPA in your own practice, you're going to have to pay for it. Uh, but it could be audit. It could be tax. It could be uh, all kinds of financial topics. That sometimes it's, it's uh, time management. So it could be more soft skills as well. But that is 40 hours a year forever to keep your license. You would be licensed by the state. Um, the State Board of Accountancy in South Carolina and Columbia, South Carolina, can come in and audit you to make sure that you've got the continuing professional education credits that you say you have. Uh, so that can be a little sticky. Any other questions? Any questions for Whitney? We've still got some time. We could all stand here and look at each other. <laughs> Do the other certifications also require continuing education in both cases? Um, you know, I don't know about all of them, but the CMA does. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of them are a lot easier to get than others. For example, this new global um, management accounting certification. Apparently, all you have to do is have one. So if you're a CMA or a CPA, they'll accept you into this whole new world of, uh, it's really an international certification program. And so a lot of people are signing up for that. Um, I'm not quite sure what their, their long-term requirements are going to be. I can almost guarantee it's going to be harder to get in later than it is now. So I think some people are, yeah. I'm an international business management major. Would you recommend getting that? 
Um, if you're an international business person, you might if you're in the accounting area. So if you're in management or marketing, you probably wouldn't need that, that particular certification. Well, I mean, it would still look great. Okay. It would look fabulous because you would be an accounting person yeah, no, that's, that's with, the, yeah. With, yeah, with the international designation, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It would be very good. And you could build on a CPA in the US, pile on the, the global management accountant certification, and you would have some significant credentials. Yeah. And as you know, credentials are what decide what your incoming salary is going to be. So th the more you've got on your resume, the more money you're going to make. But you're going to love your job too, right? So, so, yeah, so we went through all. Yeah. Of course, if they're not paying you, do you love going to work? I don't know. I mean, it depends how, how's your work. If you like it, it's not yeah, all you, about the money. I'm young. The money is the motive. When I'm older, I'm going to do something that yeah. I want. Mr. <laughs> Bowie had a pretty good story about his job. Oh, really? Yeah. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> one of many. Comments, questions. It'd be fun to do a, a survey of how many of you are more motivated by money versus love of your of your work. Let's see a show of hands of money. I could go halfway. Well, you, I guess you could say yes to both, right? Yeah. So I've seen two hands going up. So <laughs> both money and love of work. Love so that is work. the idea. Uh, I do think that if, if, uh, if you feel you're not being paid enough, you're not going to be happy. So, so that's, that's an, I think there's a lot of research on that aspect, if you feel that you're being underpaid. Can you quickly talk about the job market, what it might look like in the next three to four years for a company? Gosh, I wish I knew. Uh, let, me, let me say this about the job market, that um, we've had a recent huge recession, as you know. So starting in 2007, 2008, basically the economy bottomed out. And what happened in accounting was there was a time lag. So we were still placing some of our students in 2008, even though the stock market crashed in the, basically in the fall of 2008. Into 2009, we still had jobs in accounting. And then it kind of screeched to a halt, because as construction bottomed out, uh, most of the economy just kind of went cold. Uh, people weren't hiring accountants. And so we'd have a meet the firms night. The firms would show up and we'll say, do you have any uh, jobs? No, no, we don't have any jobs. That went on for a couple of years. But now we're seeing it all come back again, I think. Uh, you probably can speak to that as well, Whitney. Um, I, I completely agree with you. Actually, a lot of our members are on internships uh, with local and regional firms right now. So, so I, I agree with you. I think it's coming back. Yeah. So we're, we're placing people, and, and the, the way we, this seems to work is, and this is something to think about, I think, in any area of business, is that if you have a chance to have an internship, and a resort tourism people are going to do that, PGM people are going to do that, but if you're in management, marketing, finance, accounting, econ, if you can get an internship, that gives a company a chance to look you over, gives you a chance to kind of show what you can do, and especially in accounting, that's how you get the job. So something like 90% of the hires in the big accounting firms are from students who were interns as undergraduates or, or master's students who then uh, get hired. They get the offer. We have several of our people who are doing that right now. So uh, the job market, I think, is looking better. Um, I think that our, our master's students are going out around, uh, I heard this statistic, and it's $60,000 um, if they're going to a big city. Uh, that's a pretty good starting salary. Um, don't spend it all at once. Uh, don't buy the new Lexus, but you know that that's a pretty Mercedes. good. Yeah, no, no, used Mercedes. Yeah, uh, you need to be frugal. But yeah, we we do have significant jobs. I don't know if that answered the question. Question. It seems like the more common certification, at least at Coastal, is the CPA, and I think you've you know given a good overview of that. Can you speak a little bit more about the CMA, kind of the differences and what that entry-level job would look like with someone coming out with the CMA versus the CPA? Okay, so the CPA, we did talk about that, that you go into, uh, say, a public accounting firm doing tax work, audit work, uh, bookkeeping in some cases. Uh, the CMA, you typically would go work for a corporation in the finance department. And you would be doing budgeting, you would be doing special purpose an analysis, uh, doing cost accounting, you know, how much does it cost to, to, to build that chair? Probably not much, now that I'm looking at it dispassionately. But you would be working for a company, and your reports would be more or less internal to the company. So you would be 
preparing reports for the boss. What we're finding, and this is something that I've just found out in the last couple of weeks, I've talked to four of our recent graduates, and they all started out as CPAs in public accounting. That was what they wanted. They wanted to be CPAs. They wanted to go out and be in the public firms. They're all doing CMA work, every single one of them. A couple of them started in a big firm. They were successful. They got hired away by a client. They got hired away by another firm. They're doing cost accounting. And that has happened enough that the faculty is actually sitting around saying, hey, you know, we've got to make people take more cost maybe take controllership, because it seems to be that it's something that, that people end up doing. And you saw the pay, right? If you're in the CMA world, your pay is going to inch up over even the CPA on average. And so we're seeing that our, our grads are actually doing that. How does that compare to the financial management track? I don't know if you're in the finance department. How do those They're all kind of in the same area, right? The finance folks are more looking at deployment of capital. You know, how are we going to raise capital? Are we going to issue more stock? Are we going to pay dividends? Are we going to borrow? Once we do that, how are we going to uh, capital budget some of the, how, what are some of the decisions we're going to make about that capital? And the accountant is kind of tracking it, keeping track of it. I don't know if that answers your question. We seem to have a changing of the guard here. Got time for one more comment. Anybody thinking positively about accounting? One, two, three. Certifications. You got to take a lot of courses to get there. Yeah. If you want to talk about this at all, I'm down in 201D. Again, uh, Dr. Henderson, I'd love to talk to you one-on-one -on -one if you have any questions about accounting. Um, and I hope this has been helpful. I hope you enjoy this article. All 34 pages. There will be a quiz on the 34th page. So <laughs> read the first and the last. Um, Oh, we appreciate you being here. Oh, I thank you. It's a thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much.